Okay, and we are now recording. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the July 7th, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Work uh, Bylaw Working Group. Um, happy Friday, everybody. Um, <laughs> And um, let me just call up the agenda, which I have open. Um, first order of business is a note taker for today. Um, our normally scheduled note taker for today is Laura, but she is um, unavailable to take notes as she's on all, all sorts of transportation <laughs> vehicles at this point. I think there's trains and planes involved or something. Uh, so she can't really take minutes. Uh, so, um, and and uh, that would take us to Dan, but he's not, um, he's out today uh, or un, uh, not available for this meeting, uh, which brings us to Martha, who I yeah. spoke to yesterday. Uh, so Martha's an option but she would not be able to really um, fully draft the minutes. Uh, do you have some an update on that, Martha? Uh, yeah, it's just that I'll be traveling for the next couple of meetings. I can probably uh, zoom in for the meeting, but I won't have the time to really you know, watch the video and complete the minutes. So I'm happy to take the notes, as long as you don't mind if it's going to be uh, late July before the, the, the minutes are, are finalized or submitted. <laughs> I appreciate it, Martha. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm on yeah, a train, that's, train that's now. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Good travels, Laura. <laughs> the other, um, the next up would be uh, uh, Janet, actually. So if yeah. she's, she has her hand up, if she's so willing to sub, sub in, uh, I, I hate to go any further because that would take us uh, uh, back to uh, Bob who took minutes last time. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I could do today. Um, I can't do next next meeting because I'm going to be going away for two weeks. So okay. if, if Martha does it today and then I'm in July, that's all good for me either way. Well, actually, that would work out well then, um, Janet, if you can take them today uh, okay. and then and then Martha will take them next time. When, when uh, which is the special meeting. Oh, there is a special meeting as right. well. Uh, Stephanie will need notes for that too, right? Minutes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can do it then, but again, I I would I wouldn't have them ready for July twenty first. I'd have them ready probably the week afterwards. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, let's deal That's with today okay. first. And uh, so, yeah. Janet, that would be great if you could take minutes today. Okay. Uh, and then um, yes. we'll go from there. So. Uh, okay. okay. So, Janet, I noted I did wrote, note down that we started at eleven thirty one. If in case. Thank you. <laughs> And I, I do track who's taking minutes. So um, okay. uh, uh, I got you down. So so then then hopefully we'll go back. Well, maybe Dan will be available next week. I'm not sure what his travel plans are. Okay. 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 All right, great. Um I'm gonna call up the uh yep. Okay, so uh the next Agenda item is to review our minutes uh, that are available. Um, and we have two sets of minutes. If I um, review right, we have we had we had a revision uh, from six uh, uh, June 9th. And then we have uh, minutes from 623 last meeting, um, which uh, Stephanie, you just recirculated, right? Was that the minutes you recirculated? Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I did. Okay. Yes. What, Stephanie, were there any other corrections besides what I? I think there were a few. So you might, I could, I can post those. I mean, why don't you start with the ones on the ninth, and if you need me to open the ones of the third and twenty uh, third, I can share those on great. screen. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. That'd be that'd be great. Okay. So. Um, uh, have people been able to look at the revised minutes from the ninth um, and any questions or comments on those or a motion to accept those? 
Okay, this, yeah, sorry. Um, I was not able to look at them until uh, now. So these were these were the uh, minutes that, um, and, and thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'll make a motion to accept, Dwayne. Okay, great, Laura. Uh, yeah, these were the minutes on the um, Ag Solar Agrivoltaic um, meeting uh, where, um, Stephanie, thank you for filling in a lot of detail on the actual content. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, so we do have a motion to accept those minutes. Um, is there a second to that? This is Bob. I second. Thank you, Bob. Okay. All right. And a voice vote in no particular order. Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Okay, and then do you want me to put the minutes from the 23rd on the screen? Because yeah, some be people haven't seen them yet. Yeah. yeah. I did repost them to the online packet as well, but um, if people didn't get a chance to see those. Hmm. Would that be the 26th? No, this is the June 23rd. The oh, last June 23rd. meeting. Okay. Last meeting. Last meeting, sorry. That's okay. Okay, so I'll just scroll through and people can take a look. Uh, Jack, Jack's name is still no. Nope. Yeah, right I see it. <laughs> I'll I'll just go through and correct. I'll just double okay. check all of Jack's. Jack, yeah, you had a variety of spellings on your last name. <laughs> I'll correct Thank all you, those. just have a, a question on on the wetlands. I, I remember there was some discussion, and I think, Stephanie, you were the one, since you were previously wetlands coordinator, that was describing how, you know, it's difficult to really define them accurately or something in terms of trying to actually make a map. Do, am I recalling that correctly? Or Yes, that the, the delineations are good for three years. Uh -huh. So if you had a subsequent project beyond those three years, you would have to go out and re-examine the boundary. They might not change drastically, but sometimes mm. boundaries do change depending on uh, activity in other locations. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering at the point where it says the wetlands delineations are digitized and included, do we want to have a comment that says that the these wetlands the delineations can change over time or uh, um we could um that if that statement was made and you want to include that i don't know what anyone else um, join if i could jump in yeah please janet i thought the problem was that they aren't they <clears throat> they they're only digitized and put on the gis if 
the administrator is told and the problem was that he wasn't being told that that's not because they change and we wouldn't be able to capture we wouldn't be able to digitize every single wetland in town and so what we are using are the the general state mapped boundaries because there's the state has a, a wetlands map mm -hmm. that is the layer that we use we don't specifically update for local wetland boundaries every mm -hmm. time a wetland gets delineated the town yeah. doesn't go in and do that every time so typically the layer that we refer to is the one that's the state's uh, mapping so maybe we that's should the layer that we use Maybe we should add state wetlands delineations or digitize and include it in GIS. And I think that was a long discussion about whether we should or how we could and things like that in terms yeah. of the local ones and why to do it and why not to do it. Yeah, I think the it's it would be really onerous to okay. have to do that yeah. for so, local. So we just sort of rely, any project has to get verified on the ground. So there's always there has to be some kind of examination if there's a suspicion that there may be wetlands. And if there were wetlands and something was impacted, then people yeah. potentially face a violation if they haven't done their due diligence. Yeah. So that's typically how that goes. Yeah. So we can. So what do you want to say, Janet? How would you I think just say state wetlands delineations? And I mean, I don't think it's going to okay. um, change the history of the course of history, but it's a little more clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just so people don't think, ah, wonderful, and believe they can go in and uh, see all the latest right. details. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay so we'll um, we'll assume that uh, update will be made. Yes. Yeah, so so that was a requested revision to the yeah. minutes to mm -hmm. add state wetlands delineations. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start right, sharing any, on this. Yep. Any other comments or thoughts on the minutes or a motion to accept them as revised per the, the wetlands conversation? This is Bob. Um, I so move and thank you, Stephanie, for formatting and adding the links. You're welcome. I'll second. Okay, and voice vote, Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. And Brooks? Yes. Okay, the minutes are approved as amended. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, next on the agenda are um, any staff updates? Uh, so Stephanie, you first. Sure. So I had sent an email just before the meeting um, regarding a special meeting that we're proposing to have with Jonathan Murray of KP Law. Chris can speak more to this, but I just wanted to procedurally check in with everybody to ensure that first that we would have a quorum. Um, but Jonathan is available, uh, and this was in response to the meeting on May 26th, in which members had requested some guidance from him on specific sections of the bylaw. So uh, just making sure that we would have a quorum that day. Um, several times were proposed. Dwayne has said that he's available more for the morning time. So I just want to check in with others and make sure that we have a have a quorum for that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be on travel, but I can probably zoom in. Uh, on that day, so I'd I'd say uh, eighty five to ninety percent or something. Okay, would a time be would oh, earlier time be okay for you? Eleven, any time after eleven thirty. After eleven thirty. Uh, yeah, I mean eleven thirty or later. Okay, which is all right. So those are the times that they start. So that's yeah. okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Martha. 
next, right? I'd have a hard stop at, at 12.30. Okay. Ah. Jack? I am unable. Oh. Yeah, I can't do it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I have I have an appointment um, from, it looks like from 11 to noon. Okay. Um, and so I know, okay. I could, yeah. Hmm. All right. And Bob Brooks is not available. Yeah. Sounds like a bad date. It sounds like, it sounds bad yeah. because it would be good to have, you know, close to everybody. Yeah. Right. To, so we all hear the same things. Yeah, no, I, I think I agree. Having just, just a quorum is probably not ideal. And I don't even know that you will at this point. So, um, all right. So Chris and I will follow up with uh, Jonathan Murray about another date. Um, your following meeting, I, I think we didn't want to take it out of a meeting time, but maybe it would be helpful. So maybe the following meeting, which is... Um, what's that date? 14, that would be the 21st. Yeah. So we could propose maybe the 21st, but we have to make sure that Jonathan's available that date as well. Um, that if we do do it the 21st, um, just amongst us here, I mean, would, would we be, um, would people be available, say like at 10 o'clock to start? early or, or uh, 10.30 to give an hour ahead of time uh, with Jonathan? I would. Um, I would be. All right, assuming he's yeah. available. Same here. OK. Um, I expect so I'll be I'll be arriving home on, you know, after the from the West Coast on after the midnight, <laughs> but I expect I'd be uh, there, uh, set my alarm for 10. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the if we have the meeting on the 21st with Jonathan that we could start at 1030. Yeah. I mean, even starting, you know, if 1030 or 11, because even a half yeah. hour. So we'll see what works for him. Okay. And we'll shoot for that day um because it looks like we'll have a quorum for sure okay um and the only other uh updates i just wanted to let everyone know that i did forward the um new solar mapping and the article from the boston globe thank you jack sent it to everyone so um there's great information there in terms of the state's mapping which is really great timing for us because we sort of got everything all at once so um and I think that was the only other update I have. I know that the only other thing I wanted to mention was that the stretch code um, was being uh, considered by town council and they've referred it to the CRC. So although they haven't passed it, it seemed to broadly have a majority of support, at least at this point. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Any questions for Stephanie? Great, Chris. Um, any any uh, updates on on non bylaw, non -so solar bylaw issues? As we'll get into that shortly. I don't have any updates, but I wanted to ask Stephanie a question. Um, so we sent Jonathan Murray a list of questions that we developed based on um, meetings of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. And we were going to invite members of the working group to submit um, questions for Jonathan also, weren't we, Stephanie? We are going to. I just didn't want to overwhelm all at once. So I was trying to at least confirm a date and time, mm -hmm. and I'll send that out after this meeting. So I just wanted to um, get it straight in my head that we're going to send the questions that we sent to Jonathan to the working group. Correct. And then we're going to invite the working group members to submit other questions if they have them, right? To me, right, so yes. that I can add them and get them all to Jonathan mm -hmm. Okay. as one complete package of questions. All right, good. Thank you. And I have no updates. Thank you. Yes, uh, Janet, comment on that? Um, is there have we seen that list of questions i can't remember no not yet i'm about i'm going to send them after this meeting i we i we just wanted to sort of get the okay. the meeting on your radar first and determine when it would work to have the meeting 
and then we'll get you the questions because you have plenty of time to see the questions and then add your additional questions, get them to me, and then we'll put the packet together for Jonathan for that meeting so that he'll have all the questions ahead of time. Um, Go ahead. New topic. Um, is there any, like, so I've been hearing that the um, there's been like a stop work stoppage at Hickory Ridge by AMP. Um, do you have it? Is there any reason for that? I, I Someone contacted me and or I read somewhere that they haven't been working there for four weeks or something. So is there any news on that or any reason for that? Um, you'd have to check with Aaron, the wetlands administrator about that. St I don't know if that stop work was from the conservation commission. I'm not sure where that originated. So you'll have to check. Okay. I can find out or I can find out and just send you all an update. Yeah. I just didn't know if there were problems or what. So, okay. Well, if there was a stop work, that means there was an issue of something. <laughs> so, okay. you know, I don't know what I can find out, but I'll find out and send it to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yep. Okay, great. Um, any updates from committee members who liaise with other committees? No. All right. So, sounds good. Um, Yep, the only update I gave to the ECAC was an update on solar working bylaw group. So I don't have to uh, uh, do the reverse. So, uh, yeah, but and yeah. it led to a, a long discussion on their part. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right, great. So, great. Um, got through the uh, these this earlier stuff, and we can get into the meat of the agenda, which is to. Um, work on the bylaw. Um, uh, uh, Chris has provided us with, uh, as requested earlier, uh, sort of a aggregate uh, or, or complete um, document of, of uh, all the drafting that we've done to date um, uh, that we sort of get begin to get a sense of the structure and content and scope. Um, so that's one thing uh, we can just uh, opine on, I don't think, or, or discuss. I don't think we want to leave it to Chris, but we don't want to sort of necessarily go through that in detail at this point, um, unless there's questions about the structure and so forth. Uh, but then I think the key things perhaps for today um, are some, is some discussions, uh, particularly on um, uh, how we will address issues with regard to zoning on farmland um, and uh, and perhaps review what we what we've done with with uh, forests as well um, I think those were kind of the the main things um, for discussion um, and some decisions if we can uh, but let me um, turn over to Chris to see um, how she might want to uh, if she wants to sort of lead us through this Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, yes, I sent um, a document to Stephanie this morning um, with some thoughts about how to deal with uh, solar installations on agricultural lands. And um, maybe Stephanie could bring that document up. Um, a lot of it is based on, you know, things that I've talked about, read about, um, thought about over the last month or so. And um, Martha and I had a pretty in-depth discussion yesterday about how to deal with farmland. But um, let's just start. I'll read through this, and then I think there's a lot to talk about here. Mm -hmm. So I want to speak to you about whether, whether and how to regulate large-scale ground-mounted solar installations on agricultural lands. Personally, I'm not in favor of strict, strictly regulating these installations on agricultural lands because I believe that the climate crisis is so great that we need to act quickly to activate alternative energy solutions to stem the tide of climate change. Use of some farmland for such a purpose is part of the solution to climate change, in my opinion. There's not yet a problem with solar taking over farmland in our area because we're already because we are in the early stages of seeing large scale ground mounted solar installations in Amherst and to date none have been on farmland 
I wanted to make a couple of other points. Um, lots of our ag agricultural land is in APR. This, this is not part of the writing here. Um, so I'm just going to make these off the cuff and then I'll go back to the writing. Um, but lots of our agricultural land is in APR, agricultural preservation restrictions, where solar is strictly limited to no more than 200% of what the farmer is using in terms of energy. Um, and most farmers don't use a lot of energy on their farms unless they have um, electrical equipment or unless they're doing something to process um, the products that they are growing. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to make that point that APR land, um, we really have a ton of it in town and much of our really good farmland is in APR. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that I haven't come across other towns, and I've reviewed a lot of bylaws. Other people may have come across bylaws, but I haven't, that um, have restrictions on the use of farmland for, um, for solar. Um, so I think Bob had a question, but I just wanted to get to this last paragraph here. Um, I understand that there are members of the Solar Bylaw Working Group and members of the public who are very concerned about the possible loss of agricultural lands. And with that in mind, I've considered options that we can discuss for regulating solar installations on farmland. And I don't know if Bob has a question. Was this a clarifying question? You said you spoke to um, you spoke to someone else, um, Martha. There, is this your document or hers? This is my document. Yep, Thank and you. I'm. And uh, open meeting law allows me to speak to members of um, the working group without uh, worry about the open meeting law because I'm not part of the working group. I'm a staff member who advises you. Yeah, I, would just, you. I, would, I, I really, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the, the all I was doing yesterday was, was, you know, kind of reiterating what the discussion we kind of already had of, gee, you know, we had all these interesting presentations and you know what are the options i was not in any way trying to um you know influence and say you know we should do thus or not do this we were just kind of having a open uh discussion of the various options and the points that had been raised by the uh three presenters mm -hmm. yeah so anyway let me go through these options and then we can go back and discuss them one by one. Um, so I, I've come up with um, five options or, or yeah, five options. I'm sure there are others and we can discuss those too if someone wants to present them. But the first option is um, a prohibition on ground mounted solar installations on land that is categorized as prime farmland or farmland of state importance as described by the US Department of Agriculture. The second option might be um, where large scale ground mounted solar installations would be limited to a maximum of a certain size. And that could be five acres, 10 acres, 20, or some other number that people think is reasonable um, on continuous contiguous property held by a landowner on land that is characterized as prime farmland or farmland of state importance as described by the USDA. Uh, another option would be um, that these installations would be permitted on land that's characterized as prime or of state importance um, only if the project is operated as a dual use or agrivoltaics project. Um, another option, option number four, might be to set aside some land like we already propose doing with uh, forest land so that um, if Stephanie can scroll down um, a bit to the bottom of this page and the top of the following page. Um, <clears throat> so for uh, land that is prime farmland or farmland of state importance um, that we would set aside or the uh, proponent would set aside an area equal in size um, to that used for the solar installation and set aside by deed restrictions and make sure that it's actively farmed for the life of the large scale solar installation. And the dedicated farmland would be either on the same lot as the large scale installation 
or on another property in Amherst or on land in a town abutting Amherst. It will be clearly depicted on a site plan prepared by a, a surveyor and the land would be deed restricted for the life of the of the project and that the deed restriction would be recorded at the registry. And then the fifth option would be no restrictions on farmland used for large scale ground mounted solar installations. So, um, and, and then I have some um, <clears throat> links here to um, where these lands are depicted on a map. And of course we have the lands depicted on our interactive map now, the map that S Stephanie sent out a link to. So we can all go online and look at the map of Amherst and figure out where these um, solar, where these uh, prime farmlands are. So um, do we wanna go through these one by one and talk about them or do people want to just uh, start talking about them a conversation? And I guess I would say that we really should have some um, agreement on which direction we wanna go so that we can put some language into our bylaw. So that's what we're working towards. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we should probably have a little bit of a discussion first and then maybe um, with that discussion, look at these options. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest there's, um, these are actually a good set of options. They may not be exhaustive. Um, and I would also, at least my my at least one of my thoughts is that even the last option, which is no restrictions, um, there I think it's important to recognize the context that there are, um, albeit not absolute restrictions, there are policies and incentive designs at the state level that mm -hmm. encourage um, or dissuade. Um, certain types of solar. Um, so it's not it's not without any, um, even even having no restrictions is not without um, some oversight uh, or, or um, incentives from from uh, at the state level. Oh, and may I say one more thing? I think uh, one of the things I took away from, I'm sorry for not raising my hand, but um, one of the things I took away from the presentations about agrivoltaics was that it's um, very complicated and it's in its early stages. A lot of experimentation is being done, but it is um, a challenge for a farmer to take on such a project. So that was part of my thought process. So I, I'll stop now. All right. Um, any thoughts? We have Janet and looking for anybody else as well. So I, I think this is a great discussion um, and we need to have it. Um, there are other um, group towns that regulate solar and farms. Um, Duinsburg, New York has a limitation of only 10% of farmland can be covered with solar arrays. And I'm not you know, sure how they define that, but you know, to me, you know, it's, this is, um, you know, a question of goals and, and, you know, what are the goals of the group or the town or the state. And so I, you know, to me, I think we have to frame this, look at the framework of this discussion is what is the state's plan for, um, you know, climate action. And it's really clear that the state's plan is to protect farmland and expand it. Um, the same true for forests. And they're even saying take marginal farmland and protect it as part of the state's climate action plan. And fortunately, the state sees a, a path to solar without, you know, basically focusing on the built environment, which is, I guess, the article that Jack sent out yesterday in the new plan. So I would, the framework I would do is what is the state's plan? What is the town's, what is Amherst's plan that the town council has already approved? And they are saying protect natural working lands and put solar on the built environment. And so you know, and then what does the community survey say? The, the community survey, you know, almost uniformly said protect forest land. And then it was kind of mixed in terms of agricultural land. I can't remember the percentage, but I think they came out, the, the residents came out in, in, in favor of dual use. And so, you know, those, to me, that's the framework. I don't, you know, to me, it's just like, if we decide to allow 
you know, farmland, which is, you know, to be used for solar and taken out of production. We're taking land away from farmers who often don't own the land. The, the economic incentives are really towards filling up an open field with solar. Um, and why are we doing that? Why would we go against the state plan? Why would we go against our town plan? Why would we go against the survey? And if we can re you know, require dual use and define that, I think we've got a, a win. You know, the state and you know, Duane's group thinks that we can keep land in production and we can do solar. Um, we have some examples of that. And I think there are some abuses of that we could talk about, like, you know, putting eight cows or 12 sheep on large pieces of land is not quite um, keeping land in stuff. But I, I do think we we don't need to make a decision. I think this is, was decided by town council. It was decided by the state and we just need to implement it. And by implementing it, we're going to achieve town goals of fresh local food going to all income groups, sequestration, um, keeping the land open for the future. Um, you know, I, I mean, I can go on and on, but we don't have to revisit these questions when they've already been decided by the state plan and the town plan. And if we're going to report to the town council about community values, you know, the community value was dual use. Let's do both. We don't have to choose one or the other. All right, thanks for that. Um, Jack and then Laura and then Martha. Oh, um, am I next or is Martha? Uh, Jack, please. Okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, just based on what uh, Chris had said that she's not aware of other towns uh, you know, zoning or restricting, you know, uh, solar on ag lands, uh, which would make, you know, if we are doing something that has any sort of, uh, 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 you know, strength to it, I guess, you know, we would be an outlier. And I, I don't know, um, for me, I never really understood, uh, you know, agricultural lands being something that was, that we would want to protect other than what is already in place for the say the APR lands. We have a lot of protected land already. It seems to me that uh, the land that may be considered for this, uh, we, we would set additional protections that aren't in place currently. And I'm just not comfortable with us doing that as in our charge, you know, for the solar bylaw. I think I feel like that's that's the town council's charge um but anyway I, i'm just i'm just skimming through that the document here uh what's it called that stephanie just sent out but anyway i, I don't see agricultural as being something that is uh it's like more vanilla as far as i can tell in terms of their ranking system it, it's 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 completely reasonable um and again, this this is not a permanent conversion of land. It can always go back to agriculture. We're not we're not paving this property. So anyway, I you know I lean toward option five basically. I guess uh, I'd have to look into it a little bit more. Maybe, uh, you know, certainly not option four with a deed restriction. That 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 seems ridiculous to me. Um, and I guess that's, a, you know, those are just my initial comments. Thanks, Jack, yeah, for that. Um, yeah, Laura, if you can, um, if you can um, comment and you're available. Yes, I can, thank you. Um, so I think I have a few thoughts here. I mean, I, I can't agree with Chris enough in that the climate crisis is so real um, and that's that's the reason why I've been working in renewable energy for literally 20 years um, is because we have to take drastic efforts. Um, it's not even to stop to, to slow down um, where we are. I don't I, I, I agree with Jack that it's an overstretch of the committee to further limit what can be done on ag lands. Um, I also very strongly believe that it is not our place to tell a farmer what they can and cannot do with their own personal property. 
Um, I think we certainly can support agrivoltaics and say we're supportive, but Chris's point that it is still experimental um, is certainly my understanding of where we are with agrivoltaics as well. Uh, you know, I, I think perhaps that small town in upstate New York discusses Agland, but I think we can all agree that across the board it is not um, something that is incorporated into the bylaws. So, um, you know, I think uh, I agree with number five and number five, it sounds like, oh, we're supporting, you know, no regulations on ag land. The truth is we have tremendous restrictions already um, in place. And, and, and the fact that we have, I mean, just the, the land that the town owns, what's already in conservation is, is more than most communities can say. So that's my opinion. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Martha. Okay. Well, I'd like to start by referencing something that I read last night. The Massachusetts has put out a document called the Resilient Lands Initiative that was published in January and uh, talking about the strong need to preserve open lands for resiliency. And among their, um, I don't know, five or six stated goals, number one is no net loss of farms and forests. Number two is seek to expand the amount, quality, and accessibility of locally grown foods. And one of the others is uh, increase the amount of natural carbon storage for climate resilience. So I think that the goals for our state are clear, and I don't think that our town can you know, be totally in a vacuum from what the state is doing. And you know, the survey that uh, Stephanie sent around seemed to indicate there was a lot of uh, potentially available places to put solar panels to meet Massachusetts energy needs. I mean, I agree we've got to take this uh, very seriously. So I feel personally somewhere in the in the middle among these options. I mean, I found those the presentations about the agrivoltaics uh, extremely interesting. I would, in my view, I don't know how Dwayne feels. I would say that we are, you know, a few years away from being able to say, yes, agrivoltaics is a, you know, is a is a proven thing and it's going to work and so on. I mean, if I were a, a large developer, I would kind of say, whoa, I, I really want to wait a few years and and see the data uh, on crop yields, on types of things that work what arrangement of tilts of solar panels or whatever work best. And a few years from now, I think that's going to be really a great thing. But I would say that now then, uh, I would like it if our uh, bylaw could somehow encourage dual use and set some general requirements without you know, requiring dual use. I, I think personally, my big concern is about uh, locally grown food crops that I really would not uh, be in favor of allowing uh, a farm that had that was now producing you know crops, vegetables, fruits, what orchards, whatever, to convert that land to sheep grazing in order to uh, get credits from the state for the agrivoltaics. So that would be my my. Uh, one concern in terms of, of a regulation, but somehow to have, I think, some general regulations sort of in line with what the state has, you know, nothing more onerous than what uh, we heard from Greg and so on, that would encourage agrivoltaics but not require it and would encourage retention of um, growth of food crops and also uh, con conservation of the soil, maybe some uh, general requirements if you have prime farm land of not uh, allowing, you know, stripping off the soil entirely or bringing in gravel to, to, to fill in around the solar panels or something like that. Uh, 
that's a general statement. So I, I feel in, in the middle that we should be doing uh, some things based on what we've learned and the experiments that are going on and the kinds of things that Jake is doing uh, without really requiring it. So. All right, before we go, thank you, Martha. Uh, before we go to Janet, I'll just put in a few thoughts of my own. Um, a couple of things. One is um, um, I, 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 I don't really feel like it's, it's our place to sort of uh, prohibit uh, solar on, on farmland. Um, there may be some middle ground with regard to encouraging it uh, certain ways. I don't think we need to write regulations with regard to what agrivoltaics means because that's the state has done that. Um, and uh, um, has done that, I think, fairly well. Uh, uh, and so we can let the market move uh, as it will based on the incentive values and the rules and regulations and guidelines that the state has put forward with regard to solar on farmland and agrivoltaics. The other thing I would just raise also is, um, along with Chris and Jack, I believe, I think the climate emergency uh, every day uh, we read about it um, is so critical at this point that prohibiting solar development um, uh, in, in ways that the state is not doing is, is uh, I think, not a great precedent. Um, I do take uh, certainly absolutely state um, goals are to preserve, protect forest land, farmland. That doesn't mean uh, to prohibit uh, at all, in all cases, uh, development on those lands. Uh, I, I, from what I read, the state goal is protect 40% of the uh, in, 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 in uh, permanent protection of, uh, of the state land. Um, I think we have achieved that or well on our way in Amherst. Uh, that doesn't mean that some farmland or some forest land uh, should not be used for solar. Um, in fact, in reading the technical potential study that came out, um, it seemed hard pressed to me um, to envision a quick reaction uh, to the climate emergency uh, in accelerating our solar development uh, in ways that, that limit solar development to the built environment. Uh, um, uh, uh, and and I, I don't uh, read that the state plan with regard to solar development is to, uh, that, th that the uh, goals can be accomplished without any use of, uh, of um, forest land, farmland, or, or open land. Uh, in fact, I think it'd be hard to imagine that uh, these goals being met uh, strictly by the built environment. Um, and so I'm, I'm uh, certainly very concerned about uh, being overly restrictive. Uh, I also appreciate uh, Lars' comment uh, with regard to taking action that uh, really um, uh, restricts what individuals can do with their own property. Um, that seems a bit draconian to me or concerning at least. Um, these are people that uh, need to make a living um, and make decisions and have made past investments based on future opportunities. Um, and uh, while I think we can encourage uh, and maybe provide some guidance and some restrictions in certain situations, that sort of an overall uh, restriction of, uh, of any sort would be a bit of an over, overreach. Um, let's hear from Janet and then uh, anybody else, and then we can uh, sort of see where we go from here. Maybe discuss the different options. So in, I just want to, I have like four things to say, but just very quickly, um, in terms of draconian requirements on property owners, we're looking at a stretch code that's going to force people to when they build a new building to um, use certain equipment or get to net zero, Cambridge just passed a requirement that existing buildings over 100 square feet, 100,000 square feet have to get to net zero. They have to reduce their use. And so 
we ask property owners all the time or we tell them what to do all the time. So we should just like, you know, let's not wave the flag of, you know, like we can't restrict property rights because, you know, property rights are, it's like a bag of sticks and we're always regulating them. And the question is, is, is this regulation important? Is it needed? Is it fair or whatever? So I just want to push that aside. Um, I think that what's going to help us is if we look at the language in the state plan, in the CARP, our town plan, which ECAC, you know, approved and our town council had is approved. I didn't know the document that Martha's looking at. I would love to see that because I think if we sat down and read through those, it would help our understanding. Um, I also am really interested in like how many acres of non-APR land are we looking at that are suitable for, for um, large scale solar. So, um, you know, my impression from just, you know, like all of the large scale solar in Amherst is on farmland, like Amherst, Co not Amherst College, um, Hampshire College land, I think was a hay field in, in North Amherst. The solar arrays are also on farmland. So we do see examples of farmland being taken out of production. And, you know, as Laura has said, there's really no incentive for someone once they build it to put it back in. They put in millions of dollars They're making tons of, you know, 10% return. When are they going to go back? And so I think we have to, you know, put our, you know, basically implement these plans. But I also think we need to read the plans and understand the thinking behind them. Um, the other, the other question thing is we've never talked to local farmers. Most of the farmers rent land. They don't own it. And what do they think about this? You know, we could also talk to people who own farmland, haven't put in an APR and what their thoughts on this. And so I'm very hesitant to do anything without talking to the people most directly affected. Um, I'm always hesitant that way. Um, so th those, I do think we need to look at these documents, understand the thinking behind them. And, you know, in terms of the climate emergency, you know, I'm old enough that I remember when Jimmy Carter put solar panels on, you know, the White House and told people to wear a sweater and turn down the thermometer and he was voted out of office. I have been that person with my wool socks and everything for 50 years. And, you know, what shocks me is, you know, for 50 years, we haven't put solar on rooftops. We haven't put it on parking lots. We haven't put it, you know, on medians and roadways. And now we're asking the natural lands again to take the hit when all we've done is fill in farmland and forests for decades, creating the crisis. And now we're going back. Now the answer is uh, we can't meet, you know, we can meet the solar needs of our state by putting it on the built environment. And now we're gonna basically offer up more farms and more forests because of the climate emergency that we've ignored for 50 years. And, and we're also losing the capacity of that land to absorb carbon. So. I think we need to look at these documents and absorb them. You know, if you're a solar developer, it's cheaper and you make more money by filling a field or a forest with panels. You're going to make less money and pay more to do dual use. How do we get somebody to do dual use? How do we get that there? Well, you can just require it and they'll get the state money and the state incentives but we know it's going to happen because the state incentives can change with administration. It could blow in the wind. None of the, the dual use, you know, things that Jerry P Poblano was talking about were seen as a negative thing. It seemed to me like fantastic. And I thought, okay, Amherst could be the first in Massachusetts, but not the first in the country to say, you know, use the farmland for solar, but also make sure it stays in use. And we're implementing these plans we haven't read and we haven't looked at. So I, I do think we need to do a little homework and get people directly affected in, which I've been asking for since October. Great. Um, I, I have no idea of the order of the hand raises, but we'll go with Laura first or next. Yes. So next, I want to know how much is up. I feel like we're actually getting to it. Dr. Laura, Laura, we can't hear you. Yeah. Um, Your voice yeah, Laura, is really you're, fading. You're, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll come back to you. We'll come, yeah, we'll come back to you um, and maybe you'll uh, move a couple miles along the track. <laughs> um, um, not yet. 
Uh, Jack, go ahead. Had to find the cursor. Um, so, um, you know, my my comment is uh, I do uh, agree with Martha's idea in terms of encouraging dual use. Certainly, you know, that's uh, you're not going to get the capacity out of a dual use system, uh, but it is is you know certainly attractive. Uh, I would I would say um, I think if you had, pardon me. I thought it you muted yourself, Jack. <laughs> Boy, there must be uh, gnomes uh, <laughs> around here. They're attacking Laura and my computer simultaneously. Um, so I don't know what, how long I've been on mute. <laughs> Just a second. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, but I think the the actually the the use of uh, livestock on a farmland, uh, I would think enriches uh, the soil um, in the long run. I don't think I don't think that's uh, it, and if and it can be converted back. And I just think there you know there's this cycle in my mind you know of being a geologist you know looking at New England, entirely forested you know a few hundred years ago, totally deforested. Uh, as of you know, 100 years ago, uh, 200 years ago, and you know, so we're in this situation where where things come back. I thought our my, where I live, I thought our subdivision was built within a forest, basically, and then uh, we were doing some historical analysis of our subdivision. I live right by Crocker Farm, and Crocker Farm was a farm, but before that was a forest. <laughs> But anyway, our subdivision has is uh, you got amazing trees, overgrowth, uh, and I'm just kind of shocked it was a farm field in night in the 1960s, not a tree, not a tree in sight. Um, so I don't think this is a forever thing when we are using agricultural lands. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in there, and you know, and what's the what's the highest uh, best use of of property? Certainly, we need to be uh, we need food, um, but I think when I see solar, that is not a permanent installation. It could, you know, it's certainly a 20 year commitment. It could be longer if they renew, but it can always easily go back if and when food becomes a higher priority. But right now, you know, the climate situation is huge. Um, and I have to say, I mean, Hadley seems I actually kind of look forward when I go into Hadley seeing some of the large solar arrays out there because it, it it just melds I think nice with with the landscape. I don't I, it's not an eyesore. I know the one in orange as you go up on uh, 202 that's sort of an eyesore. It's close to the road, it's kind of above you and it. So there's a scenic view aspect of things I know that we will have to you know touch upon. Um but but right now I you know, I, I feel like if farmland is being fallow, there's a reason for that. You know, there's not an economic use for it right now, even though we need food. So if there's an opportunity for a farmer to help with our, you know, clean energy demand uh, or goals, then uh, that's just something that we want to encourage. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Martha, and then maybe we can um, speak about look at the at the uh, five options, I think, and 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 sort of base a discussion around <clears throat> around the direction a direction we might want to go into. Go in. Go ahead, Martha. Yeah, I just just wanted to to bring up something. I've I've seen some articles and read a fair amount recently about carbon credits, which are becoming a bigger thing than they used to be, so, uh, whatever we might personally think about allowing uh, power plants to buy credits for their emission by uh, giving, you know, paying for, you know, somebody else who has a forest or farmland and so on. And one of the options indeed is paying farmers uh, with, with a few restrictions about 
you know, certain criteria for soil enrichment to improve the carbon retention mm -hmm. and so on. But I, I just wanted to point out that for farmers who, you know, are looking for a little extra income, that is going to be a coming thing for uh, a way that a farmer who is, you know, invested in his or her farming uh, can gain a little more uh, money at, as an option to to solar panels. So that's just something to keep in 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 back of one's mind. I also uh, want to mention I'm on Joe Comerford's uh, email newsletter distribution, and. Uh, she has been making a big point and actually submitted a, a bill to the legislature uh, about uh, maybe even requiring or certainly uh, encouraging uh, parking lot canopies. And apparently uh, there's a reference to the country of France, which is now has passed a regulation that's going to require uh, solar panels over parking lots and so on. So, uh, there are various initiatives going on at the state level to really try to uh, enhance the amount of solar. But uh, I, I say here, you know, as I said before, I'm somewhere in the in the middle on this of wanting to somehow do what we can to encourage agrivoltaics and encourage farmers, but set at least some ground rules and 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 uh, some general uh, limitations. So, thank you. I could. Um, Laura, um, hopefully you're back. Yep. Can, can you hear me? Can you yeah, hear me now? Better, better okay? now? All right. Great. Like that cell phone commercial. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, so um, just a couple of points that I wanted to raise. You know, I think one one thing not to lose sight of is that even if we even if this bylaw working group came out in favor and said, you know, we want solar in all possible places in Amherst. The actual sites where it, where solar could go is very limited, primarily because of utility interconnection. So there's already a massive limiting factor here. Um, one thing I really don't like, um, and I want to have everyone be mindful of. So, Janet, you made a, a number of comments um, that I don't believe are factual, like citing the returns of solar projects why people don't do it on rooftops versus other places because it's about basically greedy corporations or you know you didn't say that but like it's about returns and then the statement that we could meet all of our solar needs on the built environment um, which i think is incorrect um, so i, I just want to be you know we all have opinions we're all passionate here but i but i don't i want to make sure that what we're saying um you know opinions versus facts um, so, and I think the final piece is, you know, when it comes to, <laughs> you know, we could research this topic for the next three years, um, but the truth is we have to get a bylaw done in what, two months now? Um, I find it very, I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that this group would consider um, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with the metaphor of we put restrictions on like building residential condos. That to me is quite different than a farmer who has been farming their land, generational farmer wants to pass the land on to the children or grandchildren and might want to change the type of crop that they farm from vegetables to solar in order to keep the land in the family and not sell it, for example to um, residential builders. As I said, I've worked with farmers in this capacity a lot. Um, and, I, and, I, and I just, I don't think we can tell people what to do with their land when it comes to individual landowners, so. Thank you, Laura. Um, <clears throat> all right, I don't wanna get into it sort of tit for tat, but um, Jan, if you just have a, a comment on, on that, uh, no, and then I, I think just... we can move forward. I just want to say what I said, which was the state has said there is enough of the built environment to take, I was at 15 or 18 times the solar that we need. So I didn't, that's not, I don't know if that's a factual statement in if they're true or not, but I'm just saying that's what they said. And I thought that was very encouraging. Um, 
I'm not saying people are greedy. I, I'm all for people making money, but they're the the fight the it's more lucrative to fill a field or you know and you know to grub a forest, cut down a forest and fill it with panels than it is to dual use. Um, the state gives a little help on that, you know, in terms of the adders, but I do think that the pressure is always going to be towards open land. And, you know, you know, like if you, you know, we are constantly limiting and telling people what to do with their property. You know, I, I you know, it's like, it's like, you know, I could, I could look at my piece of property and tell you all the things I can and can't do it because of town bylaws, because of state laws, you know, and so I, I just think saying we don't want to limit property owners when we do it everywhere else, you know, for good reasons or bad, it's just kind of thing. So, but I, I do think that we need information and, you know, to say, oh, we have two months to do it. It's like, can we collect the information that we need? Let's talk to the farmers. Let's talk to the landowners and say, do you, you know, like if somebody's a landowner and is leasing to a farmer, um, probably not making a lot of money, right, from that. But also, they may say it's fine to require dual use because they don't want to see other people lose it or they're fine with that. I don't want to speak for leasing farmers. Um, I don't want to speak for farmers. I want them to come talk to us. I don't want to talk about state plans. I want us to read it and, and get that information. I also, now that we have all this mapping, how many pieces of land are we talking about? Like Very few. You know, how many pieces of land are non-APR farmland or farm soils that are close enough to a connection to be at risk for just being filled with or at the opportunity to be filled with the rays? Because if it's if we're talking about th two different fields, that's a different than if we're talking about 15. So I, I, can we just collect that information before we make these important decisions? Bob, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I don't want to. I didn't raise my hand, but yeah, uh, just just so we all know, I am in favor of option five. I think it, it's been very interesting to listen to everybody, but I don't think we need any further restrictions. I do think we should encourage dual use. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, Jack, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say uh, on uh, Laura's point, um, you know, how, could we get a, a quick like GIS, I know we had the capability to manipulate now things, but, but if we could get a quick GIS plot of eligible lands that are outside of the APR, that are agricultural, that we're talking about, so we can get a sense of the scope of, of properties in town that would be applying to this segment of the bylaw. Could, could we do that, Chris? I think we can do that, but um, again, the answer is complicated. I was talking to Martha yesterday, and we talked about yeah. the fact that some of the land that was excluded from the GZA, um, the GZA study, I believe, I believe they excluded lands that were owned by the university and the colleges, and some of the land, particularly for Hampshire College and Amherst College that's owned by the university and the colleges is not in educational zoning district. So that means that the town actually has control over that la those lands and they're not in APR either. And so there's actually, you know, other lands besides what is depicted on the GZA map that could be developed for solar. And I think we have Steve Roof here as one of the attendees. He may be able to answer some questions. But, um, you know, I observe that there is, you know, uh, there is a fair amount of land that's not APR, that is farmland that could be developed for solar. And I still don't think we need to regulate it, but I'm just pointing out that it's not as limited as it appears on the GCA map. That's the only point I wanted to make. Thank you. And uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm a little confused about us talking to farmers again and pushing that as a more research. Um, 
Yeah, because I mean, are we talking to foresters? I mean, I, I feel like we have so much information in hand, especially with this last policy document that just came out yesterday. Uh, that, you know, I think we're on, <laughs> we should be on track to uh, to get this, you know, this draft for the bylaws together. So. Yeah, and I, I, I point out at least from the technical study that came out yesterday, um, you know, one thing we might look at is, and maybe we use their designations or other designations, but they sort of classified, obviously not all forest lands are the same, not all farmlands are the same. They had, uh, along with some other attributes, they had to this ABC um, scoring, if you will, or ranking of these, of, of, of each and every parcel. Um, based on some ecological services um, and, and, and other uh, carbon sequestration, which is a proxy, it seems to me, to the, uh, of, of the um, quality of the, of the, uh, of the forest uh, to a large extent. So, you know, maybe there is some um, uh, areas where we can look at and, and encourage in, in some ways with the, uh, with the zoning to encourage uh, development um, on lands that don't score as well. Uh, again, in, in looking at forests, which we're not talking about right now, but more farmland, but on forests, you know, maybe a, a, a greater um, ability to, to look at uh, solar development in forests that are less um, carbon intense, I, I think is the, uh, is what uh, how, how the uh, study sort of put in terms of the, the uh, sequestration capacity of the forest. Um, and, and then obviously in farmlands, there's um, uh, different soil qualities and whether it's currently in farming or fallow uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, okay, let's, I, I guess my suggestion would be to take um, uh, Chris and then Janet and then move on and maybe talk about these options. Um, and uh, take some sort of consensus of the of the group here uh, in terms of which one of these options, uh, how we react to each of these options, um, and or, or some nuances within each of the op options. Um, if that sounds good, so um, Chris. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, whatever we produce in this document, this um, solar bylaw, is a snapshot in time and things are going to change the technology will change our understanding of dual use is going to change um, potentially our need for more solar will change we can't really predict that so i think that our goal should be to get a solar bylaw in place that is good for this moment in time knowing that we always will have the opportunity to change it adjust it amend it as we move forward and gain greater knowledge so that's all i wanted to say thank you. let me just add on to that maybe chris is you know one thing that i i think we might see changing over the near near term is state policy uh in terms of incentive i think this you know based on the technical potential study that just came out in the new administration um, uh, I think we'll see, we may very likely see uh, some, some t uh, either tweaks or substantial changes to the uh, solar policy that even further um, tries to um, not prohibit, uh, but incur uh, on, on open land, but to encourage development in the built environment, which would ripple into Amherst in terms of where developers are looking and can make um, make their rate of returns um, in, in Amherst. Uh, uh, and if there's more encouragement to do the built environment, uh, we should, we should uh, that should be reflected in Amherst as well. Um, okay, uh, Janet, and then um, uh, let's sort of look at these options a little bit more explicitly. You're muted, yep, okay. So, I so I know that Hampshire College and Amherst College and UMass have all had their own climate action plans. So presumably they've all done solar assessments and they would have all the information about their open lands um, and and things like that. So that'd be great to know because if it's, you know, if there's hundreds of acres that could be converted to solar and they're really prime soils or better, don't we need to know that? Um, and so I think we could just ask that question and just say, do you have a solar assessment? And 
you know, we, we spent all this money in the solar assessment. Let's look at it and see what we're talking about. Like Jack said, and I said, I also wonder, have, have we like, has, has every member read the natural working land sections of the state plan and the CARP, the, the town's plan, because the town's plan is really strong. And, you know, our, we should be implementing these plans, not working against them. And I do see allowing more and more farmland to be converted to solar without retaining the use of these lands as, as basically going against the CARP plan. Um, another plan that we spend hundreds of thousand and ton, you know, fifty thousand dollars on. And so I just think, you know, we can all react to the options, but I, I do think we need to implement these plans and we need to know what 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 fields we're talking about. I don't want to get in front of the town council saying, yeah, I've been working on this for a year and a half. And I someone says, Well, what farms are we talking about? And I'm like, well, we don't know because we had all this information and we didn't look at it. And I don't know how you make decisions without information. I mean, if we're talking about five fields, if we're talking about 500 acres versus 10, I think we just need to know. Um, and you might say, okay, it's really just 10 acres or 50 acres. We can lose that because of the climate crisis. But if you're talking about 500 acres, that's a different story. Um, and the answer to the cli climate crisis crisis is not to fill up farmland and cut forests. Nobody I know is saying that, you know, the UN is not saying that, um, you know, the, the state plan is not saying that, you know, we did that. That's part of the climate the crisis. Dwayne, I'm sorry, I don't have a raising, uh, raise my hand feature. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I, I did want to jump in on a couple of points. Yeah, please. Definitely. Yeah. Um, First, I want to say in terms of the discussion regarding the Climate Action Plan, um, because it keeps getting referenced as um, a document which is specifically stating not to impact forests at all, I think the idea is that we want to preserve our forest land which has viable carbon sequestration um, possibility. Uh, so, for instance, maybe more some of the more mature stands, and I would reference Jonathan Thompson's presentation, which specifically stated that young monocultures of saplings are not going to have the same impact for carbon sequestration and and carbon reduction impacts as a solar development would. And there was kind of a threshold and a scale. And I think that's what he was trying to get to. And, and maybe I know Chris and I have talked about this, about sort of asking if Jonathan could potentially do an analysis of what, you know, our forest land is and where it would make sense um, for potentially preserving, preserving all of the forest stand versus there might be some small parcels or areas where actually cutting would make sense for solar installation. So I just wanted to sort of make that point. Um, and then the second point I want to make is I think if you if you could if you're going to get circular about these arguments and keep going round and round at some point, I think it might make sense to call a vote on each of the options. Um, that might make a strategic sense to move forward because you could potentially or you could just decide to stay mute on these particular topics, um, but I think you probably, my guess is you want to have something that addresses them. And you could submit a draft either way. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, and I thought that uh, what we could start doing at this point is going through these options. Um, I wouldn't mind maybe a brief discuss discussion of, of each of the options first before sort of voting on them, uh, just so we can uh, make sure we know what we are voting on, um, but then get a consensus or, or as needed a vote of the group in terms of which of these options is uh, the preferred direction. Um, okay, do people mind if we start doing that process now and, and hold your questions as we get into these options? Well, I, I'm I, not in favor of it. I, I Yeah, I would be concerned about voting. I mean, I, I agree to, that we should discuss all these, but these aren't the only options. These are kind of, you know, a set of extremes, you might say. And so I really would, pref 
would object to voting and saying, yes, we're going to choose one of these five options, because I think there are some other uh, possib possibilities that, 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 that are kind of a mixture. But so that was I, my thought was that as we discuss them, we can talk about some uh, nuances or, or uh, yeah. uh, caveats or, or additions to these options that would be uh, that um, we could possibly add some color, if you will, or some details to, to the options that we might not be comfortable uh, or or look more favor favorably at these options with some some uh, added added language. I want yeah. to clarify that I wasn't saying you should vote today or now. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying that if you continue to not be able to progress to a point of some kind of consensus, that at some point you'll need to have a vote on options, whether it be these five or six or seven, however you come up with. But at some point, I'm just saying that might be a potential step to move you forward. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's, it's this is likely to to, to uh, not be uh, completely settled today. And I agree a consensus would be the best approach. Um, and and maybe it's a, an idea of, of going through these options and trying to uh, at least uh, discard the ones that we're comfortable discarding and and uh, a more focused discussion on the remaining ones um, for next time. Um, okay. Um, Janet, I see your hand up and then we'll get going. Um, I, I really don't support voting on this. I think we need we need to read the plans. We need to answer some questions and but I'm happy to discuss it, but I, I think that I think we're just in a sort of a vacuum. I mean, we're, we're you know, Stephanie and I are sort of arguing about what the CARP says, but, but have have the other members read it? Um, well, why don't we raise questions or, or, or issues that would you would want to be answered along the way? And uh, um, there's many questions that can't really be answered. Um, and often you're sort of trying to come out with your best uh, policies or, or ideas uh, in the absence of full certainty, uh, which is often often the case. So we can talk about um, known, no, uh, known unknowns and, and unknown unknowns. <laughs> Laura, please. No, we can go ahead. I just want to say that I, you know, I support, um, you know, I think voting maybe today is premature and I think we should talk through everything, but I think you know, eventually the goal here is to, we already have an extension for um, this bylaw is we have a deadline and that deadline's September 1st, as far as I am aware. Um, so if it comes to, to voting, I think that that is, that is okay. And I think, um, so Janet, I have read the section that you're referring to, but I, I suspect that every one of us is going to synthesize information differently. So, you know, even, um, anyways, we don't need to get into examples, but um, maybe we just go ahead Dwayne, and start talking through options. All right, good, thanks. Um, Jack? Yeah, I was just saying, uh, if we could just, when we do each one, if there is a, uh, a sub option, call it like option 1A, whatever, and just, just make sure, because I was wondering, are these all the options? And maybe that can be our, our goal for yeah. today. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, uh, Chris, do you want to lead us through the options as as you sort of put them together? Sure, I'd be happy to. Sorry, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. So the first option is to prohibit um, large scale ground mounted solar installations shall be prohibited on land that is characterized as prime farmland or farmland of state importance as described by the USDA. Um, and I, I wish I had access to it like in real time here, but this is where it would be helpful to see a map of those that the extent of that. Stephanie might be able to bring it up by going on that link that um, was sent out the other day and clicking on the prime farmland that is shown on the map. That, I'm, 
definitely be helpful. Um, while she's doing that, Dwayne, can I just ask a question? Please. So, let's say that um, we decide to do something like that. You know, ban um, solar on uh, prime farmland. What I'd be very interested in knowing is, through the conversations with the attorneys, is that even legally permissible? Or are we setting ourselves up for lawsuits from the owners of such prime farmland because it doesn't fall in line with the mandate of public welfare um, and how that's very clearly defined. So public health and welfare. So anyways, that's just a, a thought for that special meeting. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think that is um, amongst the questions that have been drafted already. Yeah. And and I must say that the research I've attempted to do on, on what's the definition of prime farmland uh, was kind of made it sound kind of vague too. So. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Hmm. Okay, so. Um, so just tell us what we have this, the, the, um, yeah, okay. Hmm. Okay, so the Steph, only I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, do we know the difference between the uh, dark green and the light green? And um, just that question. I Sorry, I'm talking and I've been muted. Sorry about that. I was about to say that the prime farmland is the darkest green and the, I believe the uh, lighter green is agricultural land of, um, sig of um, significance. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so I think what you're probably wanting to focus more on are the darker green. Mm -hmm. I actually think that the farmlands of statewide significance are better, mm -hmm. and but I may be wrong. Yeah, yeah, I think both are, both are considered very important. And when I'd looked at the state maps too and blown them up, it was clear that all of Amherst, except for say our downtown district pretty much, uh, was covered by uh, being either prime or uh, of statewide importance. And, but th this, is, um, this is based on soil type. Um, uh, and despite the fact that it's, farmland soil, much of this area is not in farming, right? All right. Yeah, it was no, tight. Much Let me turn, I'm going to turn it off first, just so you can sort of yeah. see. Yeah. So again, it's, a lot of this has been blocked out, but this is just, I'm just showing you the map without it turned on so you can see. So, yeah. And then, so the, yeah, okay. The, pretty much the Connecticut River Valleys soils are all prime or better mm -hmm. and you know people of course have built on them i mean mm -hmm. and then could you uh, maybe put on the apr land as well to see what i guess that's all stuff that it's, doesn't have okay yeah that would be great yeah, ah okay yeah okay and so all that apr land is already um, this is already taken off. Taken off from the solar ranking, yeah. Correct. But here's a lot of dark green down in uh, the southern part. Is that Hampshire College land? Uh, uh, let me turn this off. I'm going to turn it off are. again just to show you. Yeah. Can't see where the roads are. There's... Yeah, but some of it, I mean, certainly Hampshire's here and some of it is, and I believe yeah. some of this is Hampshire as well. Uh-huh. But so if I turn it back on. Oh yes, it's some it's some of the of the blue, the part that was blue. Uh, it's, yeah. What are the white sections? 
um this right here is that like the wetlands or this a... is no this is so this is all hold on i'm going to turn off the prime farms all of these sections that are blanked out are the ones that were excluded okay so they either have they're either apr they might be conservation land um, and the whole point of having these layers is to actually turn them on to see why they may have been excluded so mm -hmm. let's see if i turn on apr Let's see. You had that. Oh, on. I just turned it off. Okay, so we can see where the APR lands are. I'm just going to turn that off for a second. Um, so if we can look at turn on conservation areas. Conservation, yes. Um, there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of so that I, white area is conservation area. This is yeah. APR and conservation area. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So yeah. these these are the reasons why those areas were excluded. Yeah. And why don't you put on conservation restrictions too? Um, okay. To see how much of. Uh, uh, okay, those are fairly limited. Yeah, there's not a whole lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was like the the wells in Lawrence Swamp, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So I I have a question. So can can I can, go ahead? Okay. Go ahead Jeanette. Are we okay. raising hands now or are we not? Go ahead, Laura. Yes. Laura. Okay. Um, my, my question was around, is there any other development in Amherst where we are doing this kind of analysis right now for commercial buildings or are we, is this a common practice for, let's say someone wants to put in a new condo building or whatever. You know, I only am privy to the Conservation Commission um, emphasis for evaluation, but that sort of information would be very helpful to me, because obviously my my concern is, and it's 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 we don't need to talk about it now, but um, it certainly feels like we're coming up with a whole new set of restrictions and regulations for solar, and not for anything else. And to the extent that it it could persuade a farmer who does want to relinquish their land to sell it for housing as opposed to solar. Uh -huh. um, Chris? Yeah, I wanted to make that point that um, other land, actually all the land in Amherst is zoned. It is in some zoning district and each zoning district has regulations about what can and can't go there. Most areas in town are allowed to be developed for single family homes. So anything that is not APR or conservation land or um, a conservation restriction, um, all these other lands could be developed for um, subdivisions if they are appropriate in terms of their topography and a developer would choose to develop them. And what about for other types of um, um, buildings, uh, Chris? Like, if you wanted to, not, I'm like, I'm not even sure what it would be. But other types of buildings, in, yeah, are restricted to certain zoning districts. Zoning, like, if but you not wanted to, soil, put a, does, does zoning include soil analysis? I, I would imagine no. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so, okay, so, if you wanted to put in a store, it would have to go in the you know, some kind of commercial district Correct. that where stores okay. are allowed. Yep. But to date, our zoning and any other sort of formal approval process has not considered soil analysis. So someone could put in a commercial building, like a mini, you know, strip mall with convenience stores, pizza shops, whatever, um, and soil analysis would not be included. That's correct. But when the um, initial zoning districts were um, set out, when L yeah. R R L D and farmland conservation and R O were uh, established back in the seventies or probably even before that. Um, people did look at, you know, what land was um, appropriate for farming. So most of those farming lands were considered to be either farming or you could develop them for single family development. All right, uh, Jack. Yeah, I um, just wanted to, you know, review, I find the APR, you know, fairly interesting here. And if someone, um, are there any active farms out there that are not using the the advantages of being designated as an APR right now? Um, 
I mean, what what percent of the active farms uh, are under APR, and what percent uh, are not using that? Which it seems to be very, you know, from a tax, you know, the tax advantage is very clear for the APR land. So why wouldn't a farmer be doing that? So if that's the case, why are we looking at the active farm area areas in town when we were looking at the APR uh, zoning uh, areas here? There are definitely some that aren't taking advantage. Um, I don't know what that percentage is, but we could probably find that out. I could. Um, make sure you put your hand down if you already did your thing. Um, I think. <laughs> um, uh, but we'll go with Martha. Yeah, I just wanted to ask in relation to that. What about is it is it Meadow Street? Remember where there was this terrible fire real recently on an, what was it J and J Farms where the lightning struck and so on. And there are several farms out there. Where is where is that? And is that an area that that is has the uh, uh, APR lands there? Oh, okay. No, it says not in Amherst. Yeah. Okay, so that that is also a lot of it is APR land, but the blue would be potential places for solar. Then, excuse me. I think the a APR land to the west of one sixteen includes the J and J farm. So uh -huh. between Meadow Street and one sixteen is where that occurred, I believe, uh -huh. and yes, that is right. APR land, and it is in Amherst. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So okay. that, um, yeah, because that's that certainly is one big area of farming, uh, and uh, okay. yeah, uh, Janet. Um. So this this is great, and this is sort of starting to answer the question I was asking: is like how many farms? Like I think in that little corner, um, in the I don't I want to say I'm trying to get my my directions north west corner with the white land i think i think most of the land on the other side of 116 has been protected and there's one um farm that or i don't think it's being cultivated i think it's fallow right now the white piece and then um there's a bunch of coals land on the other side that isn't protected and you know part of mitchell farm is and not and then in southeast street i think andrew's greenhouse isn't protected i don't think any of the um hampshire college lands um or you know are protected and you know part of some of these are like missing pieces of a puzzle that the town is trying to put together um like to protect um north northeast street and east street has been a target for um aprs for a long time and so there's kind of a you know the open space and recreation plan has things that they're trying to keep open and so um or acquire the um development rights too um, so I think this is maybe helpful, maybe where Dave Zomac could come in and say, where are the unprotected farms? And then we could, you know, and to see if it's part of that open space plan or not. Um, just wanted to pass it along. The other piece of information on the zoning is that in a lot of the um, land that's zoned residential in um, farmland areas, the density is very limited. So you could build a house on it, but you would need three acres um, and then there's all these different ways if you want to do a cluster development setting aside. So the, I think they were considering the soils or the, the use of the land and trying to protect it um, from having, you know, a really dense subdivision right next to a farm because of conflicts and things like that. So um, and the other thing I want to say, which is, you know, if I was in a mediation, I'd be saying, you know, what are your goals? And so if your goals are to protect farmland and keep it in use for all the good reasons, you know, from sequestration to producing food to the future to, you know, scenic views, um, whatever, um, keeping in a local economy going and strengthening it and stuff like that. How do you keep the land in protection? How do you keep farmland going? If your goal is to protect farmland and keep it usable, and also to develop solar, how do you do both of those things? How, do, how can you achieve that? And so, you know, we know we're in a climate crisis. We can just step outside and see that. We know it's worse than we thought or most people thought. Um, and how do we use that same land for solar? 
and how do you how do you do these two different goals on the same pieces of land? You know, my first question is, do you need to? And if you do, how do you make it compatible or you get enough, you know, both uses together? And I think requiring dual use is one way of ensuring the land is protected for future use and also allowing solar that's needed. And, um, you know, I don't know if we're the first town to do that. I, I probably guess that we're not. Um, I don't want to make a factual statement that, you know, nobody else is doing this. I know Dwaynesburg, you know, came out with something else. But if, if we have mutual goals for the same land, how do we get there in a way that all the parties' interests are protected? You know, if, if you require dual use, it doesn't mean the farmer loses the value of the solar. It just means they'll get more of an incentive and then less, less solar or they're Okay, good. Um, we're not making good progress through the options, um, but this has been helpful discussion. Um, uh, um, um, and I'm, I'm looking at time and I do wanna leave time for public comment um, in about five minutes. So um, let's, Jack, do you have something that yeah, I just want to say I, I actually have the uh, spreadsheet open here. Uh, it looks like Amherst uh, GIS has uh, 2,100 acres uh, of land that's APR designated, which is about 12% of the land in Amherst. And but they also have it categorized as agricultural, which is 700 additional acres, which is 16%. So I don't know if the difference there that you know, we can ask uh, Dave Zomag uh, that, but you know, 12% uh, of APR land in, in any community, I think that, that that's, that's amazing, uh, you know, so. Jack, could you say those acre numbers again? I, I didn't get it. Yeah, the spreadsheet from Amherst, uh, town of Amherst uh, totals 2,185 acres. For, for all properties that are uh, APR. And that's just downloaded. But the these the zoning map, uh, when it, you know, they have an agricultural uh, category and that says 2,864 acres, which is 16% of the total land area. And so your question is, is, is the APR land part of that 2,800? Oh, it definitely, it's gotta be. It's just the the other seven hundred. What is that? Oh, okay. That's yeah. Okay. okay, I understand. Yeah. But, okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Chris. Yeah. Um. Just two things. One is that um, there's about seventeen thousand acres of land in Amherst, and at the very beginning of when we started to meet, um, I believe someone asked Steve Roof roughly what would be Amherst's share, you know, and there's all kinds of um, arguments for and against talking about Amherst's share, but he mentioned a number of 300 acres and everybody was aghast. But when you look at, you know, 17,000 acres in Amherst, and then you look at 300 acres as potential for solar, um, it's really like, I think it's 1.7% of the whole town so it's really not that much land. So I'm just pointing that out because I don't think that Amherst is going to end up being wall-to-wall -wall solar arrays. I think it's going to be fairly limited. So that's the end of my statement. But the next thing I wanted to talk about is, does Dwayne want me to proceed to option two or are we going to go to um, public comment? I think we, what I'd like to sort of, tee up maybe for conversation next time to get through these different options and, and perhaps reach a consensus or at least navigate towards an, a consensus is that uh, for the purpose of farmland, um, I, I don't think there's a strong consensus for an outright prohibition of, of any solar on farmland. Um, I think there's some um, discussion about um, some degree of, of either requirement or um, uh, encouragement of dual use 
agrivoltaics on farmland. Um, I think we want to sort of figure out if we do want to go in that direction, um, what subset of farmland would that requirement or encouragement be applied to? Mm -hmm. uh, is it all farmland? Uh, it can't be by soil type because there's so much soil that's not in not even close to being in agriculture. Uh, does it need to be on active farms? Does it need to be uh, if, if it's farm it's a farm if it's a farmland that's not prime agricultural land, does it is it a requirement or an encouragement? Um, uh, or do we want to uh, just leave it alone and go with more the option? Uh, five, which is no restrictions, let the state incentives help drive the market uh, where to encourage dual use as, as, it, as it is, but not, um, not uh, do that ourselves in, in our town uh, at the town level. Uh, so that's sort of my thought of how we could sort of um, begin framing this as a discussion next time, uh, if people think that's reasonable uh, sort of summary. Of where we where, where the uh, where the issues are, hmm. Janet. Um, I got confused because I was note taking but not hearing. So, in your middle ground, you were saying what subset of farmland would be subject to sort of a encouragement or requirement of dual use, and then you said something else. Clarify. Well, because um, I said it couldn't, that it may depend on the soil types. Okay. It may depend on the, um, and I'm just throwing these out as ideas, uh, of the, you know, historical use of the land for farming over the last five years. Um, uh, it may be based on the type of farming, um, those sort of things. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, Martha? Yeah, there was there was one document that would sometime in the past year got sent around, and I don't remember the title. It was two or three pages, and the author was somebody whose first name was Kip, and it was suggestions for um, how to uh, retain some of the soil characteristics and so on. Uh, you know, rather specific suggestions. And so if I find it, I'd like to just ask Stephanie if you could send it around again, because that had some of what I picture as examples of, you know, regulations that I would say aren't too onerous, but about say preserving this topsoil or, you know, how much you could remove or add or, uh, you know, a, a few things like that that might pertain to farmland uh, as, as regulations, so I just like to have that circulated for people to read. Let me let me also uh, yeah thank you Martha for that. And let me turn over for some public comments. But um, for, so for anybody attending from the public who would like to make a comment, get ready to rate or raise your hand. Um, I just wanted to also encourage us as committee members um, to between now and the next meeting. Um, play around as much as you can with these maps. Uh, mm -hmm. So you um, sort of answer the questions or come come up with questions um, uh, that you can bring forward to the group, um, uh, uh, looking to, to sort of deal with some of the issues that we've been dealing with here to sort of get a better understanding and grounding um, of, um, of what we're talking about in terms of scale and, and opportunities uh, and restrictions in Amherst already. Um, uh, so I en encourage that as well as um, reading carefully um, uh, the the um, the, the um, clean energy climate plan and also the technical solar study that uh, the state just brought, uh, released yesterday. Okay, good. Um, okay, so let's um, go to public comments, um, and um, we have four people attending, and appreciate um, your participation. Um, and please raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment and Stephanie will move you over to um, the room where you can make comments here. And I think Steve, you were first.
Stephanie, you're on mute if you want to. Here I am. I think okay. I'm, yeah. I'm good. So okay, Steve, thanks. thank you. Um, fascinating. This, this is Steve Roof uh, from South Amherst. Um, fascinating meeting and discussion, you guys. A couple of things that uh, were brought up, my name mentioned a few times. I think it's true that Hampshire College owned lands are not in APRs. Um, I believe, I'm not positive, but I believe at least some of those lands have deed restrictions that prevent the land from being used for things other than farming. Um, so that they're not APR, but they may have some deed restrictions on them. Uh, a, a different point, Hampshire College solar fields, they were put on agricultural lands, but we did develop several criteria for ourselves to ensure that they, these lands could be returned back to agriculture um, if and when we did not need them for solar, or perhaps we only needed one of the two fields for solar at some point in the future. Um, those criteria included things like not disturbing the topsoil, no grading, minimal um, compaction of the soil, minimal construction of gravel roads and concrete pads. So I can share that um, through Stephanie, what those guidelines were that, that might be of some interest to your committee. Um, third thing that came up was, um, yeah, the, the ECAC discussed this idea of the Amherst share and that um, we provided a memo and I think Duane was the lead author on that. So um, that is, is correct that it was a little bit under 2% was our, I think our final sort of estimate on making various assumptions. So you can refer to that uh, for more details about what the what an Amher share could look like with certain different assumptions. And then finally, just my own comment here, a question actually, I think, um, good discussion on, on preserving and protecting farmlands. And I think this was brought up, but I wanted to emphasize it. I question how well those designations of the USDA prime farmland and farmland of statewide importance capture the farmland. Um, I was inspired by, for this question by reading the, the technical feasibility report released yesterday. There's a section in there that says that only 6% of Massachusetts is designated as farmland, but 25% of Massachusetts is classified as prime agricultural soil. So just maybe those soil designations are not the best way to identify farms that you may consider protecting. It may be that those, if you, if you use those soil designations, you might be preventing solar development on lands that are not used for farming where that solar development might be perfectly appropriate. So you might see if you can find a different way of identifying those active farms if your committee does choose to proceed with some sort of restrictions of, of solar development on active farms. So that's my suggestion. Um, thanks again for all your in-depth conversations and, and good luck with, with the development of your bylaw. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Mike Lupinski, you can go ahead and unmute. Uh, yes, I just have a number of comments about things that were brought up during the meeting today. Um, the first is, and it's great timing, is there there really is no such thing as Amherst share of solar. This is a creation that was made up by Steve and Duane and got a little nod of okay from the other members of ECAC. It's based on either population or land. It makes little to no sense when you apply it to other cities and towns around Massachusetts. There is no such thing as Boston share of solar. There's no such thing as Florida, Massachusetts share of solar development. It's just, it's, it's an exercise done in a napkin, uh, you know, by a couple of guys who were just wanted to justify having a lot of solar in Amherst. You cannot find a, an edict from the state saying that every town has a certain share of ground knowledge solar because it just does not work. So please, whenever you hear that, realize that it's just something that's made up. It is not real. Um, early in the uh, conversation, it was brought up that there's been a lack of construction at uh, Hickory Ridge. I think Janet mentioned four weeks. The actual number based on today is seven weeks. And that's no visible construction at all going on. Um, this is interesting because oftentimes we see this idea of 
um, climate emergency, then you get this sense of, well, we're just gonna put all these solar panels out and it's going to solve the climate emergency. Well, this project is a good example of, it looks like the developer hasn't gotten the message that we're in an emergency situation because here we are in prime construction time and yet nothing's happening. I don't know the reason why it's sitting there empty. I would think that maybe uh, Stephanie or Chris would have a better idea, but I have a hard time finding someone in town to ask and get a straight answer on why is nothing happening. I don't know if they haven't gotten a building permit yet. I don't know if there's environmental issues. I don't think it's a stop work order, but I can't get anyone to answer my questions. Um, it's, it's interesting also in the sense that if you go to Hickory Ridge, there was a big rush to cut down all the trees there in the winter time. Those same trees are still sitting there seven months later. What does that tell you about emergencies? Um, a couple other things that I'm surprised you weren't told about today because they apply directly to your subject matter. On June 14th, AMP, which is now known as Pure Sky, filed an application, put in a solar development here in Amherst. This solar development is the same one that was mentioned a couple of years ago. It's a 9.35 megawatt solar facility, 4.4 megawatt AC ground mounted photovoltaic installation with battery energy storage. The total area of the project is 41 acres to be located on a 102 acre site. It's a totally wooded site. It's a mature forest land off of Shutesbury Road. It ties directly into the different subjects you were talking about today. It, there is not one bit of meadow in this area. It is entirely forest land. The same company that's dragging their heels at Hickory Ridge is proposing to build the same, uh, a, a similar type development in forested land, 40 acres, which will be the area of disturbance. When you talk about forest, that means cutting down every single tree, ripping out every single sapling, destroying every bit of that ecosystem. It's interesting to see because obviously the, our solar bylaw committee isn't going to have any impact on that. I mean, they've already submitted the application, but you might use that as a lens to look at as you're putting together a solar bylaw. How does that fit into your thinking? Because here's, in my opinion, is a worst case situation. Forest land sitting there you know, contributing to the climate um, and now it's going to be ripped out to put up solar. So that's in the, that's in the uh, hopper. It was filed with the town clerk on uh, June 26. It looks like there may be a public hearing scheduled with the ZBA sometime in August. I'm surprised you haven't heard anything about that. Um, and then I just have one, one last question because I think, it, I think it's, um, it's something that's been bothering me all along as I've listened to these meetings and that's with UMass. You know, they've been left out of your studies. They've been left out of the maps. I'm just, and I would think, don't even know the answer to this. How much ground mounted solar is UMass planning to put in? Um, I can't speak for the university on that. Um, um, the, I, I do know that the electricity needs in the decarbonization plan for the university, the, the electricity needs um, are going to be far, far greater than the amount of solar that could technically even be placed on the campus. Um, and um, uh, so there'll be, so, so any, any solar that can be sited on campus would be consumed by, uh, or, uh, yeah, basically consumed by the university loads themselves. Um, you know, as you do know, the university has has um, focused on on uh, parking lot canopies, um, and um, uh, I'm not aware of any significant projects that are ground mounted at this point. Okay, so my in my opinion, what you see in there is a classic double standard where UMass with huge amounts of land when we talk about doing their share, it is proposing to do zero 
ground mounted solar. Whereas Amherst is supposed to do their share. And if you go by Steve and uh, Dwayne's figures, we're supposed to do a, a couple hundred acres worth of solar. This is just another example how share doesn't really exist. Amherst College says that they're, they're um, fighting for the climate because they're buying their energy from a, a solar farm in Maine. How much uh, ground mounted solar is Amherst College putting in? I think the answer is probably the same as what you heard from Dwayne. So let's not you know, be talking about Amherst share when we have these huge uh, universities and colleges that have no intention of doing ground mounted solar on their property. That's all I have for today. And Eric, thank go you. ahead and unmute. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great, uh, I just wanted to follow up on Mike's um, statement, Mike Lipinski's statement. The, um, in calculating the town's uh, acreage and Chris cited it 17,000, it's between 17 and 18,000, 20% of Amherst is, um, is either um, UMass, Amherst College, or Hampshire College land. It's one out of every five acres. And to just kind of not have a, an open dialogue, a, at least a, to kind of a, a, have a discussion about what the campuses are intending to do to alleviate, mitigate this tremendous uh, catastrophic climate crisis that we're all dealing with, I think is, is just simply just missing, I mean, missing the opportunity to have a robust conversation that we're all in this together. So I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that here we are, um, um, ECAC has existed since 2019, that, that we have a uh, solo bio working group for the last year and a half, that we have just kind of siloed our campuses and, re and really not engaged in a, a comprehensive look at how we as a community, which includes over about 20% of our land tied to a campuses as to how we're gonna um, together embark on a solution. So I, I uh, appreciate your work and would hope that it would get even broader and deeper and include the campuses. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, yep. Okay, um, Janet, one last comment and then we're over time, so. So I just wanna reinforce those comments because it supports my previous question, um, which is, you know, all, you know, Amherst College, Hampshire College and UMass all have net zero plans. They've all done assessments. Um, I, you know, they are all looking to get solar power electricity from solar power off campus as well as partly on campus. Can we just get those plans in some specificity? I did ask Amherst College um, facilities person, uh, Tom Davies, who appears in front of the planning board a few times and he gave me, referred me to some general stuff, but it just seems like this question is important because we're talking about fair share and percentages and you know all the rooftop, big rooftops and all the big parking fields are all on the institutional lands. We just don't have that much of it. And so it seems like if, if UMass isn't really planning to put a lot of rooftop in or do all their parking lots, um, if Hampshire College has acres and acres and acres of undeveloped fields, let's just find out like what their plans are for there and what their assessments say, um, because that could open a dialogue. Um, but you know, I know I'm an information heavy person, but I feel like we've been here for more than a year. And these are, you know, I wish I had seen the Cadmus and Nietzsche study a year ago, not a year late. And so I, I do think that all this information is here. It's in our community. There are people who have been paid to put these plans together who could just answer questions and we could just see it. This is my plea. All right, well, I can reference a website uh, for, at UMass, it has the carbon zero um, uh, information on it to the extent that it exists. It's not a detailed plan. There's a, a roadmap. Uh, they have, we have not gotten into the specificity of we want solar here, here, and here. It's There's much bigger issues to some extent uh, in terms of the geo exchange uh, to be built and the building retrofits that need to be 
are required in the um, district heating that needs to be revamped. Um, when the solar is kind of a bit of an add on because it's very small compared to our demands. Um, and I don't want to harp on the uh, fair share because uh, uh, there's different opinions on that. But if we were to recalculate the fair share, uh, including the university and college's lands, and we would have to include their electricity loads. Um, and, um, uh, and to some extent, our fair share would actually increase uh, because um, uh, the, the um, uh, or, or the, the the amount of solar we would need would would incre increase respectively. Um, that being said, um, the fair share, as was pointed out, is just uh, two geeky guys uh, uh, prevent, providing some analysis to help frame the situation, not to set policy. Okay, um, with that, um, let me uh, call the meeting. Uh, to an end uh, as we're over time um, and um, appreciate everybody. Good, good conversation um, to be continued. And I think we have to do something similar on forest lands, um, uh, uh, though we have a, a start with that already with some drafting that we put together, but we want to revisit that again. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, we'll continue this conversation on farmland next time, perhaps, um, following some uh, 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 conversation with the, uh, with the uh, attorney. Can Wayne, I let me schedule? just say, I, I thank Steve for offering to send the criteria that they were using, and I hope he will, and Stephanie, that you forward to us, because that's the kind of thing I had in mind uh, for, you know, criteria about preserving soil and, uh, you know, yep. soil compaction and so on. I'll follow up with Steve. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, I, I have a notes question. Are we meeting possibly for three hours next time? Is that? Sounds like it. Okay. I think um, I'm, we have to find out, I would say potentially right now, say the meeting would be from 1030. We just have to confirm with Jonathan Murray. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you, everybody. Um, and with that, let's uh, adjourn the meeting. Um, thank you, have a good weekend. All right, bye-bye. See you all. <laughs>